have you heard the latest crazy idea about aero engines? Some Air Force chap, Whittle, I think his name is, or something like that. Yes, something about using gas, 500 or 600 degrees temperature. Nothing could take a temperature like that. Why, the whole thing would explode in his face. He could play a piano without having had a lesson, pick up my old violin and play it. So bright and all so alert. Well, he was a genius. By 1936, he envisaged all the forms of turbine engine we know today. Well, I suppose he was good-looking, but the uniform made, made, made the man, really. My wife suddenly asked him, Frank, do you realize what you have achieved? And Frank said, yes. It's not often that an engineer is given the honour of a memorial service at Westminster Abbey. But in November, the Royal Air Force paid tribute to one of its favourite sons, Sir Frank Whittle, who died last summer. Frank Whittle laid the foundations for the major aero engine industries of today by developing the first successful and commercially viable design. The story is one of fluctuating fortune, of struggle against lack of vision, of financial crises, of bureaucratic caution, and of personal ill health. I was born on June the 1st, 1907 in Coventry. My parents were working class. My father was a foreman in machine tool manufacturers. I lived in Coventry for nine years, went to an elementary school there, and then the family moved to Leamington Spa because my father bought a small, very small, engineering outfit called the Leamington Valve and Piston Ring Company. And I really did get my first engineering experiences there because I helped him sometimes for, I think it was about twopence an hour or something like that. Uh, uh, making slots in valve stems. In an interview never broadcast until now, Frank Whittle tells his own story, a story that changed the world. I was always attracted to flying from my earliest years almost. When I was for my favourite toy, and this was 1911, was a tin model of a, a Blerio. And my heroes were people like Captain Albert Ball and Major McCudden and so on, the VCs of the First World War, and I just wanted to fly. So I'd applied to join as an apprentice. The RAF, however, rejected young Whittle because he was too small. I uh, was sunk for the time being, but before I left the camp, a, a very kindly physical training sergeant, if you can imagine such a thing, uh, <laughs> took pity on me and he gave me a diet to follow and uh, um, a series of exercises, Maxalding exercises. I did all that for six months. I put on three inches on height and three inches on my chest. So I thought, well, I'll have another shot. And I wrote to the ministry, but they said, no, once you've uh, been turned down, you've been turned down forever. So I thought, well, I'd go through the whole process again in the hope that the uh, bureaucracy wouldn't pick it up. And I was lucky that time and ended up at Cranwell in number four wing. Whittle didn't enjoy life as an RAF apprentice, a rank which offered no chance to fly. But he found his niche in the Model Aircraft Society, building working replicas. His plane-making skills singled him out to the authorities. But there was another reason why his commanding officer thought Whittle might be officer material. He thought that he'd got a, a mathematical genius. Less than 1% of apprentices became officers, but Whittle made this huge step. The officers' training college at Cramwell was next to the apprentices' wing, but socially a world apart. 
It shared the ethos of the public schools from where most of its cadets had come. It was an intensive education for Whittle, but it did include flying lessons. I learned to fly on the Avro 504K. That was a, a, a very ancient type of aeroplane, 1911 type. The sort with a toothpick between the wheels, you know, to prevent it tipping over on its nose, which in reality it helps it to tip it over on its nose, <laughs> or even turn upside down. Whittle soon became a daring, if overconfident pilot, and one who had his fair share of accidents. He used to fly upside down over the housing, all against the regulations, of course. Oh, they thought he was marvellous at it, although he nearly frightened my mother to death flying upside down. Nearly dropped a sandbag out of an aircraft once, which was ballasting the aircraft, you know, in the rear seat. And uh, nearly gave her a heart attack, I think, at the time. Between flying and the Cranwell course, Whittle conceived the idea that would make him famous. It started with a student thesis. All cadets had to write a thesis, and um, I chose future developments in aircraft design, rather ambitious, and rather concentrated on the engine side. But the main thing in that thesis was that uh, I arrived at what I now know, know was the well-known Breguet formula, I wasn't familiar with it at the time, connecting speed, range, engine efficiency and so forth. And to me, that meant that if you wanted to go very fast and far, you would have to go very high, at heights of 50,000 feet, that sort of thing, at heights where the piston engine obviously wouldn't work, and at speeds which the pre pre uh, where the propeller wouldn't work. So it was, I started to look for a new kind of power plant. The propeller planes of the day could only fly at 150 miles an hour. They were noisy and shook the pilot badly. That's because their engines were simply car motors on a bigger scale, with many moving parts. Whittle felt an ascetic dislike for these machines. The problem with the piston engine as you go up height, even though you supercharge it, is that the power drops off as the air gets thinner, and there eventually comes a point where it, it won't generate enough power to turn itself over against its own friction. Whittle's idea was based on the same principle as a balloon filled with air. When this escapes, we all know what happens. Well, it didn't come to me out of the blue for the simple reason that I've been trying to find it for 18 months. But just the, the thought, you might say that came out of the blue. But how could an engine recreate this force? I considered a piston engine driving a fan inside a hollow fuselage and then thought, well, why not throw that piston engine away, up the compression ratio of the fan and substitute a turbine for the piston engine? And there was the turbojet. Whittle's plan proposed only a single moving part. This would be a shaft with a compressor driven by a turbine at the other end. It would work like this. The compressor spins round, sucking air into combustion chambers at four times atmospheric pressure. Here, this air is mixed with vaporized fuel and ignited. The hot gas created expands through the turbine, turning the shaft, and escapes into the atmosphere. It is this continuous force which propels a jet aeroplane along. After the idea had come to me, I thought, oh my goodness, why didn't I think of this before? And it seemed so obvious then. That was the moment of genius. Whittle was a pilot officer aged just 21. I was at the Central Flying School at Wittering uh, doing the flying instructor's course. One of the instructors there was W.E.P. Johnson, who became a very good friend and colleague in later years, and he'd been trained as a patent agent. And he became very really interested in my proposal. He thought it would work, and he helped me to draft a patent. Have you ever patented anything? No, I don't know a thing about it. Does a patent both publish and protect? 
That is the whole point of patents. But one thing's essential. File a patent application before touting the thing round. Otherwise, you haven't a hope. I'll tell you what, let's rough out a specification now. Oh, what? Fine, what do we do? Well, you make a rather better sketch, and I'll get on with the clever bit, the writing. Okay. Would this dream fade forgotten too? Or might it usher in a revolution in technology? Eventually it would, but there were huge obstacles. According to the theories of the time, there was this fundamental difficulty with gas turbines, inefficient compressors, inefficient turbines, and the other big snag was the materials then existing in 1929 wouldn't stand temperatures of more than, say, about 500 degrees centigrade. But I knew, or felt pretty confident, that they would evolve in the normal course of development, and of course they did. Full of enthusiasm, this positive young officer went to the Air Ministry to propose his revolutionary idea to one of its top scientists, A. A. Griffith. Well, I explained it, and uh, uh, Griffith uh, pointed out an error in my calculations, and it was all rather depressing, you know. And then after that, I got a letter from the Air Ministry saying, in effect, that uh, they weren't really interested and so forth. Despite this blow, Whittle continued to develop his idea and his flying skills. He was one of the RAF's best pilots and took part in the Hendon Air Pageants, thrilling the public with his skills at crazy flying. These were the red arrows of their day. The Air Force decided to invest further in Whittle's education. So, in 1934, he went to Cambridge University. Without a degree, Whittle had lacked credibility as an inventor. Now he could put that right. One of his friends at Cambridge was Arnold Hall. Right, sir, Arnold. Your first visit in 1936? Since, since birth. Well, no, I've been, of course, to the college since then and looked at the place, but I've never been in the room before. No, really? <laughs> uh, almost there. Yeah. Here you are, sir, Arnold. By 12, 1933. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I should imagine it brings back some memories. Me, it looks just the same. Not quite. We used to have a cold coal fire there. Indeed, yes, yes. Much We're more comfortable. Yeah. I'll leave you to it, Ronald. Yes. Thank you. thank you very much. Different outlook, too. Building outside. I used to have this room a little differently. The table was over there, and the settee was here. But otherwise, there's no change. <laughs> I was very surprised one day when I was doing no harm to anyone in this room. There was a heavy knock on the door and I opened it and there was this Royal Air Force officer uh, with a pile of drawings under his uh, arm and he aggressively said, do you know anything about grass turbines? And I was an honest man in those days, I said, no, not a thing. He said, well, got, I want to show you something. Yeah, and I will remember. <laughs> covered the table with sketches and drawings of all sorts, and, and there it was, and explained to me the essence of, of his invention. And uh, he said, well, you see, everyone's against this. Nobody thinks it'll work. Uh, he added, I'm quite sure it will. And uh, I feel I want a pal or two around that I can talk to about who might be interested in it. And that's how our friendship started. It was a extraordinary to watch him absorbing the Cambridge ed education, particularly in, in engineering, and moving every piece of learning he got in that department straight onto his jet engine. I had got the feeling, rather, that I might, might be ahead of my time. Um, with the extra knowledge I gained at Cambridge, I did become rather more aware of the difficulties. Whittle himself had some visitors at Cambridge two former Air Force officers who knew about his idea. They had since become entrepreneurs. And they approached me with the idea of forming a company and getting on with it, and they succeeded. They managed to find um, a firm of investment bankers called O.T. Falcon Partners. And in March 1936, they formed the company called Power Jets Limited. I was very much wanted first-class honors. 
So I had to work like hell because I was designing the jet engine and uh, preparing for my finals at the same time. And that was a very difficult thing to do. I succeeded in getting my first happily and uh, then was able to uh, turn back to the jet engine. Whittle turned to a firm in rugby to build the world's first jet engine. British Thomson Houston was a manufacturer of steam turbines. But Whittle only had 2,000 pounds with which to tempt them. His object of going to BTH was to see if they, who were steam turbine manufacturers, would make his engine as, as drawn by him at that time for this money. And um, we went down the road from Cambridge to Rugby with Frank rehearsing all the things he had to say to the steam turbine people and turning round to the passengers in the back to emphasise his points. Uh, a terrifying journey, but we managed to survive and got there. The BTH built the engine. I stood over it, more or less, while it was going on. I felt that we were going to be all right as far as the simple centrifugal compressor was concerned. I felt that I, the turbine was going to be all right, but I was uneasy about the combustion problem because we were aiming at 24 times the kind of in combustion intensity that was um, obtainable in those days. But the engine became ready for running proper on April the 12th of 1937. A lot of people said it wouldn't even turn itself over. What did happen proved the very opposite. I gave a signal with my hands to raise the speed with the electric motors, 2,000 RPM, and that was done. And then I opened the main control, and it, it started to run away. It accelerated out of control, and so did everyone standing around it. They all went down the factory like the wind. I didn't because I was petrified with fright. I just couldn't move. It seemed like perpetual motion, but uh, of course it wasn't. The fact was that a pool of fuel had accumulated in the combustion chamber, which we didn't know about, and that was keeping it running after I'd switched off the control. Well, that sort of thing happened day after day. We had about four of that kind of runaway. Just after the engine first ran and we'd submitted a report to the Air Ministry, this was the subject of a, another report by Griffith, the man who turned the job down in the early days, and his report damned it with faint praise. Uh, he brought in all the difficulties, said that no propeller meant that we wouldn't have the slipstream to help us take off and so forth. During these years, one of Britain's top technical civil servants was Lord Kings Norton. Well, this is what we call the main collection room. And really, the collection is in three parts. We have, of course, all the pictures you see, which are prints and drawings. He was Whittle's champion during the war and recalls how mistaken was ministry policy towards the engine. You have to remember that high authority in government then was not technologically educated. Probably you could make the same criticism today. Whittle's original ideas were encompassed in his master patent of January 1930, in which uh, a cross-section of the engine of an engine it was clearly demonstrated. Um, that was not a, a secret patent. There was nobody in the Air Ministry who had the sense to um, make it one. And that and subsequent um, additional patents were all known to the Germans who took it up uh, avidly while our Air Ministry were refusing to um, put any money into it at all. And that is why the very first flight of a jet-propelled aeroplane was the Heinkel with the, an engine designed by von Ohain. It was not a very good job. 
Yet Britain knew nothing about Germany's jet program. On the eve of war, Whittle's position at power jets was precarious. But the potential of his engine was beginning to dawn on people. The aeronautics department here was closed down because of the Im impending likelihood of, of war. And I was asked to go to Farnborough to um, help build a wind tunnel. Now this wind tunnel was a, a rather special project. It was to work at 600 miles an hour at that time an unknown speed. And it really represented a change of view of the authorities about the Whittle engine. On June the 30th of 1939, we managed to get a big breakthrough in the attitude of the Amnesty in that Pi, Director of Scientific Research, uh, came up to see the engine run and we managed to keep it going for about 20 minutes in his presence and he became a complete convert. So much so that he, he agreed that an engine for flight should be ordered and that an aeroplane to use it should be ordered too. This, of course, was the big turning point in the whole job. When it was recognised that the Whittle engine might have a very profound effect on warfare, it had to be accelerated because there was a war on, and in the war you accelerated anything that would help. By now, Whittle had been forced to move from Rugby to an old foundry at nearby Lutterworth. Ladywood Works was the name of the site. Today, there's nothing to show that history was once made here. In 1940, Betty Lawton joined Power Jets as a secretary. Surprise, really, it's still standing. Such as they are, these were the original buildings, the only offices, really, that were available at the time. When Sir Frank came over from BT8 at Rugby, there's the main entrance, and then these were whatever offices there were. And then Sir Frank had the office in the corner. And that's where he used to, in between times, when he was contemplating different things, he'd open the window and shoot a few rabbits. <laughs> it's rather dilapidated, doesn't it, I'm afraid? But we had some happy times here. In 1939, we only had uh, just a handful of, of about half a dozen. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, and then beginning of 1940, we began to build up a team. And I was very careful in picking uh, real quality. You know, first class honours Cambridge, first class honours Oxford, Imperial College of Science. One of the bright young engineers Whittle recruited was Geoffrey Bone, then a reserve technical officer in the RAF. Well, he was a, an interesting and decisive little man sitting behind a desk and uh, um, his first uh, remark to me was, well, thank God they've sent somebody in uniform because I can now order you what to do instead of asking some of these civilians. To me, he came across as somebody with a very high intellect. Another recruit was Bob Fielden. We only had uh, rudimentary resources. I remember, for example, we were given, uh, all given a weekend off while uh, a brave man wearing a respirator got up on ladders and blew off the foundry sand from the rafters uh, of our workshop as this sand kept on blowing down and uh, falling on precision pieces of equipment. It was uh, not a favourable situation at all. When I first uh, arrived, I was put more or less straight away onto combustion testing and combustion development because the problem at the time was how to burn the necessary vast quantities of paraffin in the small space of the 10 combustion chambers. And uh, the fuel didn't burn adequately and produced vast quantities of smelly gases called aldehydes. And we were used to work in conditions of this ladywood works, um, very often with our feet soaked in paraffin and our clothes and uniform soaked in paraffin. It was just all hours that the good Lord sent, including weekends and so on. And this meant that uh, uh, any of us who had girlfriends, they had to rather neglect them, or those who hadn't, hadn't time to find them. 
lack of space forced Whittle himself to work at Brownsover Hall, a country house nearby. All Mrs Barton Lee's furniture was just pushed to the wall and two desks were put in. It wasn't all carpeted like this. We didn't have central heating. It was quite cold, just had an open fire. It's a lovely room, a lovely setting. It's very peaceful for him, for his work, you know. When you think, I mean, he wouldn't have had that peace at Little us. The engine's running. Oh, well, Sir Frank was great. I mean, I used to work in the next office. And when he opened the door there, framed it with his uniform, very smart gentleman, a very unassuming sort of person, very kind. Nobody could have had a nicer boss. He was the father figure for everybody. I mean, his enthusiasm rubbed off onto everyone else. He do worked and worked and worked. I mean, he was a workaholic. It, it, it did affect his health, yes, definitely. In addition to our continuing financial problems, we had many others, including one string of engineering problems, like having to use the same parts over and over again when they ought to have been scrapped. And of course that was linked with the finance because we couldn't afford new parts. We had to make do and furbish up damaged parts. By May 1941, a custom-built plane had been made by Gloucesters for the power jet's engine. The top-secret aircraft was taken to Cranwell for its maiden flight. The power jet's team went up to Cranwell full of hope. Today, Geoffrey Bone is one of the few surviving witnesses of the occasion. All it needed was good weather for the test pilot, Jerry Sayer. Well, we thought that Jerry Sayers was probably just going to do another taxi trial, as he had been doing on some previous runs. But I think we all hoped that as the weather had cleared a bit, that uh, this might be more than just uh, the, the previous short run, and so it turned out to be. Jerry Sayer was sitting at the end of the runway, and a party of us was sitting just to the right, and he held it on the brakes and ran out the engine to full speed, released his brakes, and then he, he hopped off in about 600 yards. Quite an impressive takeoff. Then he held it down level and then climbed. The feeling of surprise coupled with elation when we saw that he was not, in fact, pulling up at the end of the airfield, but was going, going on uh, up into the sky was, uh, well, it was quite, quite amazing, really. One of my colleagues, Pat Johnson, W.E.P. Johnson, slapped me on the back. He said, Frank, it flies. And in the tension of the moment, I rather rudely said, that was bloody well what it was designed to do, isn't it? Mm. I can remember the fact that there was a, quite a lot of blue sky in stripes that evening and he disappeared into cloud. And the new whistling noise of the 2839 ushered in a new sound in the sky and you could always hear the continuing of this whistling sound. And the, the amazing feeling one had, almost a surreal feeling, and he sailed back and landed perfectly. Somebody somewhere, I can't tell you who it was, produced a bottle of champagne. It was the first time I'd ever had any. And we all sort of celebrated, probably not out of glasses, probably cups, but at least we did it. Oh, there was great hilarity, as you can imagine, when, it, when word got back that it had flown. We had a party, of course, but it had to be a very subdued party because on the one hand, the people who were in the know were um, quite fired up, um, but we couldn't uh, let the rest of the uh, officers who were mulling around in the mess uh, into, into the secret. People in the area hadn't heard that uh, particular kind of noise before, 
and you couldn't really hide it, however secret it was supposed to be. Uh, one officer was said to have asked another one, how does that thing work, John? And John replied, oh, it's easy, old boy, it just sucks itself along like a hoover. Whittle had a terrific fight uh, all that time to get this kind of recognition, but the flight made all the difference. It was a manifest success. A great interest. And one of the outcomes was my idea of creating a, a, for, a more or less formal way in which the interested in parts of the um, uh, aircraft engine industry uh, could uh, collaborate. So we formed the Gas Turbine Collaboration Committee and I was chairman of it. All this, of course, is putting power jets into a weaker and weaker position from the commercial point of view. But then we, and that we had to uh, swallow because it's a wartime situation. And I and several other, several other uh, of my team were serving officers. And uh, we had to put um, national considerations before commercial considerations. That was very dominant in my mind. British industry itself was working flat out building engines for warplanes like the Spitfire and Hurricane. So in 1941, the country turned to America for help in building Whittle's engine, giving away the secret in the process. Churchill and Roosevelt knew that America had got to come in in the end and wanted to be ready for the day. And what is more, we wanted to be sure that we could have a satisfactory production even though we were being bombed to the Dickens ourselves. And so there was every reason for getting American manufacturing um, behind us, even if they'd never come in uh, to the war. We shipped over the um, engine in parts in, in the Bombay of the Liberator, and also with the team, who were, in, who were horribly frightened lest the pilot should pull the wrong uh, lever and they'd all drop into the Atlantic. For America, the jet story began the night of October 4th, 1941, with the arrival of a highly secret engine assembly in a Boston airport. It was Britain's now famous Whittle turbojet, the first jet engine successfully produced and flown by the Allies. Gentlemen, I give you the Whittle engine. Consult all you wish and arrive at any decision you please, just as long as you accept a contract to build 15 of them. They had that engine, their engine, version of the W2B, called the Type I, on test in April of 42, so just rather less than six months, which is astonishing. And uh, even better than that, uh, six months later, the Bell Aircraft Company had their twin engine jet flying. Whittle himself went over to America to advise with building the engines for this plane. It was most satisfying to see the work GE were doing because, uh, well, they got on with the job so fast. It was uh, remarkable. And their enthusiasm was most inspiring. And I thought at the time, if only I had had that kind of cooperation a few years earlier, what a difference it would have made. This is a meteor, and the meteor was, of course, the main focus of effort in the 1940s in the endeavor to get a fighter aircraft into the air for usable by the RAF ahead of the Germans. The Air Force eagerly awaited this new plane, but Power Jets was denied the means to mass produce its engines. The job had been given to Rover, the car maker. We intended that the uh, Rover Company should be uh, subcontractors and only subcontractors, but unfortunately they went behind our back to the Ministry and, and tried to get direct contracts, and eventually they succeeded in doing that. And instead of being subcontractors to us, they in effect became competitors who had the advantage of having all our information handed to them on the orders of the Ministry. Rover also made design changes to the Meteor's engines, which greatly delayed their production. The problem was only solved 
when Rover was told to give the job to Rolls-Royce, with its vast expertise in aero engines. But this would only weaken power jets further. Ernest Hayes was the chief executive of Rolls-Royce, and he was responsible for the Rolls-Royce part in taking over the jet development. Of course, he, he had come to realise that this was the future of the aero engine. And since Rolls-Royce then were uh, one of the most pr prominent aero engine firms in the world, he wasn't going to be left out. He was a, I would call him an honest rogue, because when he was going to do the dirt, he told you he was in advance. And one of the things he said to me on one occasion was, we're going to be the centre of this job and nothing you can do will stop us. You must realise that all these companies who uh, took up the work, notably Rolls-Royce, they all admired Whittle and his work enormously. But they had policies for their own companies which ran rather counter to what Whittle would have wanted for his company. One can't uh, criticise them adversely. It's just, I'm afraid, uh, the way of things. January 1944, at which time, for reasons I don't really know, um, the British and American governments decided to uh, make an announcement about it. <laughs> it was like the world blew up around me. The shock was very considerable. The press descended on the Whittle household. He wasn't allowed to tell Mother what he was doing. And I think she really felt rather offended by that. So there was a sort of an atmosphere. And she says he has had time for nothing but his job. I got fed up about it sometimes. What woman wouldn't? But I knew how important it was. So I didn't grumble. Well, that's right. She was a good support to him. You know, they parted company in 1951, but um, there was never any acrimony between them. It was a cold day in January when this first appeared in the newspaper. Of course, what's, what's interesting about this is how the journalists had quite a problem as to what headlines they were going to put on it. The first thing is a fighter with no propeller. And then they say driven by hot air. I think a lot of people wondered where on earth the hot air was coming from. Um, and it's, it's delightful. They say all tests passed. Well, one can only uh, wish that that had, in fact, been the case. Adulated by the press, it seemed Whittle was at his peak. Power jets by now had a factory where engines could be made in volume. Whittle had a clear vision for his company. No one except power jets had risked any money, except the, the government, of course. And I felt that uh, the government having put in two million that uh, all the companies should be nationalised, forming a collective turbojet establishment, and, of course, I hoped that power jets would be the, uh, at the top of the pyramid, with myself as chief engineer. But only power jets was nationalised, and to Whittle's dismay, he was then told it could not make engines in competition with private industry. So we, the people who had pioneered the whole thing, were deprived of the right to design and build engines. Needless to say, he was disappointed. And I think from the point of view of uh, an RAF officer, he had regarded power jets to some extent as an operational command. And it's, as it were, he had this operational command taken off him. I tried to help him. I thought he could have been the head of a bigger organisation building engines. But um, in the high parts of the government, this was felt not the right idea. Whittle's fame meant a busy life giving lectures here and abroad. But in his mind were visions for the jet engines of the next 20 years. And yet his former rivals never hired him. I know there were talks between Hives and Whittle, which Hives had, in which Hives had the idea of bringing Whittle into the Rolls-Royce ambit and team, but they didn't quite agree. 
I, I think I'd put it that I was sorry rather than surprised. <laughs> Frank Whittle, very determined, very talented man, but he was essentially someone who wanted to get on and do things. He, he was single-minded. That sort of person, of course, and particularly in a post-war situation, um, can be regarded as rather a nuisance, <laughs> put it that way. Whittle's stature made him hard to place in an industry which he had founded himself. But Britain soon thanked him with a knighthood. He was also rewarded financially. Was this really enough for founding such a huge industry? Well, I'm quite sure it wasn't. I think that in light of what has happened, of course, as a result of Whittle's work, you could see that he was much under-rewarded in, uh, in that way, if you want to put it in money terms. I remember particularly uh, the way he was uh, so very loyal to all his staff. And uh, when he had his first award, he called several of us into his office one by one and uh, asked us about our personal situations and then wrote out checks to us, uh, giving us uh, part of the award, which was extremely generous of him. Whittle's loyalty to his staff inspired their lifelong devotion, but they moved on, and he left the Air Force he loved so much. He had time on his hands to travel and to try to recuperate. In many ways, I paid quite heavily for um, the work I did. There was the awful race against time. That dominated life. On top of all the technical difficulties, there were the financial difficulties, there was the skullduggery of uh, uh, people who were uh, messing things up, and uh, oh, it was frustration after frustration, and it took its toll. I began to have a series of nervous breakdowns, and for years, it was years before I really recovered my health. So the jet age began without Whittle. Britain launched the world's first jet airliner, the Comet, in 1949. The plane was a fruition of all Whittle's dreams. Jets also powered British nuclear bombers, but the nation couldn't afford such planes. They became museum pieces. It was an American model, Boeing 707, which brought long-range jet travel to the masses. Soon, airlines were mostly buying planes from America. And in the 70s, Whittle himself went to live there. Well, he always said that he felt he got more recognition there. And uh, it, it is, of course, uh, a much more open society uh, than uh, the somewhat class-risen society in Britain is. And uh, he just felt at home there. He loved their attitude, so gung-ho and and keen and, and always willing to praise you for something you did well. Whereas here, there was always an embarrassment and... Um... In the mid-80s, Britain again remembered its genius of the jet. The Queen awarded him the Order of Merit. Oh, he was uh, very, very distinctly uh, happy about it. But at the same time, I think that uh, he, he always felt a little bit that the uh, British were a little late in, in recognising what he'd managed to achieve. His legacy, of course, is profound. People can travel cheaply and safely very long distances. What are the political results of that? They are enormous. The races are intermingled. Distances which made contact almost impossible are now possible in a few hours. You've only to stand in the middle of Heathrow and see what is happening there to realize that this has totally changed the lives of people. Whittle's work also has a special legacy for Britain. The famous plane makers have gone, but Rolls Royce still leads the world in building jet engines. I can only say it's extremely satisfying, especially when you see something like the Concorde. And one of the things you see I never foresaw when I was working on this thing is that I would be a passenger crossing the Atlantic in three and a half hours. Now, incidentally, another thing I didn't foresee is that I would have a son who would be flying 747s as a captain.
he and I had wanted the opportunity to fly together, preferably in an open cockpit biplane so that together we could loop and spin and climb and dive. This modest ambition was never realized for one reason or another. On the last morning of his life, I leant over his bed and said, Dad, let's put on our kit and go flying. He opened his eyes and looked at me and smiled. That evening, with Hazel holding his hand, he died. And I wondered, I wondered if he went flying and if he did, if he went on his own, or did he have a companion? In April 1937, Air Commodore Sir Frank Whittle's first gas turbine aero engine was given its initial trials. This engine was designed and built with the assistance of the BTH company. The firm of Power Jets Limited had been formed to proceed with its development. After working under Whittle's direction at a small factory near Rugby, the firm moved in 1943 to a new factory near Leicester, built for them by the government. Here, rapid progress was made in the development and manufacture of Whittle engines. This is a model of the W2700 engine, which although weighing only slightly more than the original flight engine, developed three times the power. The way in which the Whittle jet engine works is simple. Air is drawn into the engine by a centrifugal compressor. Although similar to the compressor of an ordinary aero engine supercharger, it is much larger, handling more than ten times the amount of air. After being compressed, the air passes to the combustion chambers where it is heated by a spray of burning paraffin or petrol. The heated air and products of combustion then pass straight to the turbine, which is driven round at speeds up to nearly 20,000 revolutions per minute. The turbine in turn drives the compressor, to which it is directly coupled. A large part of the energy in the heated air is absorbed by the turbine to enable it to drive the compressor and fuel pump. The remaining energy is used directly in the jet to drive the plane forward. In May 1941, the first flight of a British jet-propelled aeroplane took place. Built by the Gloucester Aircrafts Company and powered by a Whittle engine, the E-28 was purely an experimental plane. With this plane, much useful flying experience was obtained. The absence of noise and vibration in the cockpit, coupled with the simplicity of the controls, greatly impressed the pilots. can now be seen in the Science Museum, South Kensington. Here is the prototype of the RAF's first jet fighter, the Gloucester Meteor. 
The early Meteors were powered by Rolls-Royce Welland engines. These were a development of the Whittle W2B engine. The first RAF squadron to be equipped with Meteors was number 616. After carrying out their initial training at Farnborough, they transferred to Manston Aerodrome, Kent, in the summer of 1944. While at Manston, they went into action against the flying bombs and were found to be the most successful of our fighters, shooting down the greatest number of bombs per flying hour. years later, the first British Aircraft's Constructor Show to be held at Farnborough took place in September 1948. Although piston engines were still in evidence, jets were very much to the fore. Next to the standard Meteor stood the first Meteor Trainer, recently returned from a successful tour of Europe. In it, Gloucester's chief test pilot, Bill Waterton, had given several continental countries their first experience of a jet plane's speed and grace. Close by stood the de Havilland Ghost Engine Vampire, the first jet plane to hold the world's altitude record. The first single-engine jet fighter specially designed for the Navy. Powered by a Neen, its short twin jet pipes allow extra space for fuel tanks and thus give it increased range. The first jet-driven all-wing aircraft, the AW-52. The first four-jet airliner, the Neen engine Tudor 8, two days after making its maiden flight. And the world's first jet airliner, the experimental Neen Viking. And here comes the first jet flying boat, piloted by Geoffrey Tyson. The Saunders Row naval fighter doesn't seem to mind which way up it flies. Its two Metropolitan Vickers axial flow turbines give it great speed and maneuverability. Meteor Mark IV takes off. Here comes the Vampire. Some expert aerobatics by John Derry. naval fighter. The Meteor Trainer. W-52.
and so to the future. Jet propelled airliners will fly fast and at great heights. The world will grow smaller. We were running into all sorts of difficulties in 37 and 38, and not the least of which was the financial problem. <clears throat> because our financial backers were expecting miracles, I suppose. They thought we would have a, an aero engine within a, a matter of weeks. But of course, we had breakdown after breakdown, and they began to lose heart. And uh, they did not produce the, the money that they promised. The, what, they had an option, you see, to produce a certain amount of money after a certain amount of time, and they obviously got cold feet. The result of that was that the control of the company passed into the hands of Williams, Tilling and myself. It didn't give us any money. But one of the conditions that um, we made for Falcon Partners to stay in the job was that they found a certain amount of money, and they did, in fact, put in another £3,000. And we were further helped by the fact that the BTH accepted 2,400 shares instead of £2,400 for a reconstruction of the engine. When we were in financial difficulty, the, the air ministry were very hesitant to help because we were in financial, financial difficulty. There was a catch-22 situation going on. They said, this is a company backed by the city, Falcon Partners being a city company, who were just out to make money quick and uh, here they are running out of money. They don't have the courage to put money in. We're not going to risk our money. And so, as I say, you had a catch-22 situation. But they did, after it first run the engine and shown that it at least was self-driving, they did agree to um, a very limited contract, uh, £200 an hour for running of the second edition for 10 hours. That would have been... 10,000, 2,000 who would manage to complete it, a thousand pounds for a report on what had happened up to then, and so forth, a, a contract which totaled about 5,000 pounds. But there was another catch-22 situ uh, catch situation came out of that, because as soon as they gave us a contract, we came under the Official Secrets Act and couldn't raise private money. Because you can't go to people and say, look, we've got a wonderful idea, put some money into it. We can't tell you what it is. <laughs> so the acceptance of a contract from the ministry virtually stopped us from raising private money. However, you had in, I think, Sir Henry Tizard, and I think also in um, Arthur Tedder, uh, some fairly staunch friends during 37, 38, 39. One of the big factors in our... Uh, in the course of the development was that um, we enlisted the interest of um, Air Marshal Tedder and Sir Henry Tizard. And Sir Henry at that time was chairman of the Aeronautical Research Council and he, you might say, was a believer in gas turbines. And fortunately too, he seemed to be a believer in me. He seemed to think that uh, I knew what I was doing. And I think in the, in the light of event, uh, he would possibly right, and uh, Ted uh, came up to see, see what we were doing and saw the engine run and was suitably impressed, and uh, uh, he became a convert and decided to back the project. But at that time, the uh, Director of Scientific Research and the DDSR from the Air Ministry, what was their attitude? The, the Director of Scientific Research had been converted about... Uh, uh, a, a, a little earlier than uh, uh, Ted, Tedder and Tizard because he was more intimately connected with it. But uh, he'd been a sceptic, you know, up to about June 1939. Uh, he'd g been giving us the money, what little he did give us, on the basis that it was long-term research. And he thought it would contribute to what was going on at Farnborough. And, of course, at that point, was it 1937-38, can you just give, this, give me this back? In, at that time, you had from Farnborough in the person of A.A. Griffith a rather unsatisfactory report. And when, uh, just after the engine first ran, and we'd submitted a report to the Air Ministry, this was the subject of a, another report by Griffith, the man who turned the job down in the early days, and his report damned it with faint praise. 
Uh, he brought in all the difficulties, said that no propeller meant that we wouldn't have the slipstream to help us take off and so forth. And his final conclusion was more or less that it might have some use if high performance were needed for a very short time. I don't know why Griffith reached that conclusion, except that he seemed to ignore what we were trying to do. He talked as though the whole idea was to fly just where the Spitfire and other aeroplanes were flying, namely at heights up to, say, 20,000 feet and so forth. He didn't seem to register that we were aiming to fly at 40,000, 50,000 feet, well, even 60,000 feet. Fine, I come now to uh, Dr. David Pye and um, June the 30th, I think, 1939, wasn't it? Can you tell me what happened on that day, the 30th of June? On June the uh, 30th of 1939, we managed to get a big breakthrough in the attitude of the ministry in that uh, 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 Pye, Director of Scientific Research, uh, came up to see the engine run and we managed to keep it going for about 20 minutes in his presence at 16,500 RPM, at which speed it pulled about 860 pounds of thrust, and he became a complete convert. So much so that he, he agreed that an engine for flight should be ordered and that an aeroplane to use it should be ordered too. Perhaps you could give me that little anecdote about driving him back to the station. Uh, an odd thing was that... Um, he became such a convert that when I drove him back to the station to get his train back to London, I had the curious experience of hearing him explain to me all the advantages of the engine, that it could run on any fuel, that it was vibrationless, etc., etc. Uh, when they, uh, a minister decided we got a good project, they wanted to give an order for an aeroplane and for the engine. Well, they gave us the job of the, uh, getting on with the engine, and we sub subcontracted the building of it to the BTH. We wanted them to give us the order for the aeroplane too, so that we could subcontract and thereby control it. But they wouldn't have that. They gave the contract direct to Gloucester's. Well, that was fine, as it proved, because Gloucester's uh, under Carter proved to be very efficient. So the arrangement was satisfactory in the end. And uh, so we designed the W1 engine for flight. Some, very similar to the original engine called the WU, but uh, very much lighter. It uh, was designed to produce a 1,240 pounds thrust, and uh, the weight came out at about 620 pounds. Uh, the consequence of having to allow both for the difference in speed between the root and the tip of the blade, and for the difference in speed of the whirling air entering the blades, it meant doubling the twist of the blades. Another consequence of this uh, way of designing was that it made a tremendous difference to the end load on the bearing. In fact, the end load of 1,800 pounds they'd been talking about virtually vanished. Simplicity, I think, was the keynote of the first engine, wasn't it? The simple centrifugal press compressor. Perhaps you could explain that. Uh... We aimed to have the simplest possible engine to start with. Uh, there were certain alternatives open to us, uh, the centrifugal compressor or the actual axial flow compressor. The centrifugal compressor is a very simple thing. It's simply a kind of glorified rotor, the kind that you have, say, in a vacuum cleaner, and uh, with the diffuser blades on the outside. So there's just that uh, single set of blades for the compressor. And instead of the axial flow, which has many, many rows of uh, blades, each, each of them having, say, 50 blades, so it's a much more complicated device. Um, I sat on the fence and I took out my first pen because I had a two-stage axial flow uh, with the centrifugal stage as a third stage. But when I came down to designing the engine, it had to be simple. So I selected the single-stage compressor, centrifugal type, with a single-stage turbine on the same shaft. But the airflow was curved, in fact, wasn't it? it well, not, uh, not originally. Uh, uh, well, there were three sets, really. You might say the first was curved in that we used a single sausage-shaped combustion chamber. Then we went to, uh, to uh, um, a rather complicated one, which I won't attempt to explain now. And from that, we went to uh, what came to be known as the reverse flow kind. Uh, the reason for that being that we wanted to be able to use the same 
rotor assembly, that's compressor and turbine, that we had all along. And, and we could only do that by using reverse flow combustion. The, you didn't go along with A.A. Griffiths altogether in the aerodynamic blades design. How, how were your blades designed? Griffiths uh, uh, had a, a theory that uh, you should design the blades as aerofoils. But I, I did not agree with that then and I do not agree with it now. He argued that you should design the blades. I say that you should design the channels between the blades. Uh, which meant what? The difference being that um, uh, well, it, it, since you are uh, steering fluid uh, through channels, clearly it's the channels that are important. If you make a, an aerofoil and then bend it uh, to give the right kind of angles you need in a turbine, then you get uh, uh, constriction and divergence which you don't want in a channel. Fine. This may be the point, in fact, I'd like to go over it again in this context. Can you tell me something now about the vortex blading theory and how it came to be an issue? Uh, I found out by uh, more or less by chance that the uh, turbine blades being designed by the BTH were based on a quite different concept of blade design than uh, uh, what I thought was proper. And I didn't realise this until, um, I, you see, I'd left the blade design to them until I went to a meeting in the, the Deputy Chief Engineer's office and where they were discussing a change in the blade design. And they were saying that one of the consequences of that change would be a change in the end thrust on the rotor. Uh, the, the load on the bearing, thrust bearing, would be 1,800 pounds uh, instead of 150 or whatever it was. And I couldn't understand this. Uh, so I went away and thought about it. And I went out to the blade design office and asked one of the engineers there, L.J. Cheshire, I said, what uh, do you assume to be the pressure difference between the root of the blades and the tip of the blades after the fluid leaves the nozzle, nozzles? And he said, what pressure difference? So, uh, to my astonishment, I found that they did not assume that the air coming out of the nozzles was whirling, but that each nozzle pair of nozzles was sending out straight jets, which of course is not what happens. And then if the effect of this was that you altered the blade, uh, is it pitch or...? This uh, particular, I pointed out that uh, uh, the uh, fluid coming out of the nozzle ring would be a vortex and that the centrifugal pressure gradient meant there would be a corresponding difference in velocity. See, at the root, of, at, at the inside smaller diameter of a vortex, fluid is moving much faster than it is at the tips. Uh, you see that in a, a, a water running out of a, a, a bathtub. And uh, as the water moves nearer and nearer to the centre of the vortex, it spins faster and faster. Well, that's what happens in the flow out of a set of turbine nozzle rings. And to allow for that, it means that you have to put a good deal of extra twist on the blades. In fact, double the twists that they were, the BTAs were putting on. And that settled the problem. Right, I come now to um, Power Jets itself, the company in 1939. How many employees did you have and uh, how many of them were fully trained engineers? In 1939, we only had uh, uh, just a handful of, of about half a dozen. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, and then beginning of 1940, we began to build up a team. And I was very careful in picking uh, real quality. No, first class honours Cambridge, first class honours Oxford, Imperial College of Science, and so forth, Whitworth Scholars. Oh, I had quite a, a collection, and I think I can claim to have built up um, a, a brilliant team. A young team? A young team, yes, uh, mainly. Uh, there were just, uh, one was a little bit older than myself then, and then we, uh, we added to that one of my former instructors, he, uh, he became my deputy. He was quite a bit older than me. That was Wing Commander Lees. And uh, presumably for the, uh, the young engineers, how were they recruited in terms of secrecy? When we uh, were recruiting young engineers, they, had to, they came to this scruffy old foundry that we were now inhabiting and were somewhat surprised, I think, when uh, our managing director, as he had become, L.L. White, uh, they went in through in this uh, uh, old ancient brick building up to a, a, a rickety wooden stairs into an office with a beautiful carpet. Farnborough had started, <coughs> and indeed was the first research establishment in the world, to start work on 
compressibility and, and transonic testing. And it started using the Spitfire 5 back in 1941. Its boffins realised they had the key to supersonic flight. So they issued a specification in 1943 for a supersonic research aircraft. And they chose a Miles aircraft to design, with the help of Farnborough, the actual aircraft. This was designated the Miles M52. One has to say they made a very good job of it. It had a f special engine to be built by Frank Whittle, which was turbid fan with reheat. We believe we could reach a thousand miles an hour. And the aircraft had also a biconvex wing, which was known as the Gillette wing. And thirdly, it had a flying tail. This folds the tailplane and its elevator into one solid piece, which makes the aircraft more controllable as it nears supersonic speed. I think because of the impression that I made, or so I'm told, with getting the mozzie on the deck, they thought we'll use this guy in the high speed flight. In 1944, Brown became the Navy's first pilot to fly a jet aeroplane. By contrast, no test pilot at Miles had yet flown one. I was chosen to be the pilot on it for the simple reason that the fuselage at the pilot position was only four feet in diameter, and you couldn't get a pilot in there with of more than five feet eight. In December 1945, when the aircraft was 92% ready for first flight, there arose a great problem that um, Frank Whittle, who was then running power jets, fell out with the establishment over the question of whether he or Rolls-Royce should produce production jet engines. It was ruled that Rolls-Royce should do it. He was so unhappy with this that he resigned from power jets. A month and a half later, the M52 was cancelled. I had already been given the date for the first flight, which was to be October 1946 at Boscombe Down. There was no prior notification given either to Miles or to Farnborough. And I was hopping mad, frankly, when I heard the, the decision. Nobody would tell Brown why the M52 had been cancelled. About six months before the cancellation, the Ministry of Aircraft Production had ordered that we receive a visit from the Americans, that everything be shown to them, nothing to be withheld from them whatsoever. They would even be given copies of all the reports and copies of the design work, etc., Without this visit, the Americans would not have advanced through the Sand Valley with the X-1 as early as they did. I think it was certainly well within our grasp and taken away, and this is the galling thing, for a reason that up to today we are not sure why it was done. Have you thought how your own life would have gone down a different avenue, perhaps? Perhaps, yes. <laughs> I wouldn't have relished it to the same degree, I don't think. While waiting to fly the M52, Brown had been working at Farnborough on another project that would further expand the military potential of jet aeroplanes. Uh, we, we, we were advertising, but of course we couldn't say what we were ad advertising for. And when we were interviewing them, we couldn't tell them what we wanted them for, although I think some of them guessed from the questions we asked. Can you give me some idea of the costs, the power jets' total costs to 1939 compared with Germany? Right from the start, we were working on a shoestring financially. Uh, Two thousand pounds was the original sum subscribed, but dribs and drabs of money came in. You know, two hundred pounds. Uh, 
a friend of mine, 500 pounds from a friend of someone else, and it built up slowly. And uh, by 1939, we had spent, uh, I think, I don't know the actual figure, but I think it was about 7,000 7, pounds in the balance sheet for July of 1939, uh, the item to cost of unit was 4,000 and a few hundred pounds. So though we'd been going for over two years, we had, uh, that's all we'd spent on the engine. We were doing monthly bill, uh, uh, BTS were doing it on a cost plus basis, but fortunately for us, their overheads were only 150%. The, um the fact of the matter is, of course, that you were having to rebuild the engine out of old parts, and I think the official historian says that this really hampered progress quite considerably. We were hampered repeatedly, not only by money difficulties, but by, uh, uh, well, associated with money difficulties. We couldn't afford to replace parts which had been damaged. Overall, at this time, were you aware that uh, Whitehall itself was troubled by what it felt to be the anomalous position of power jets? Uh, I don't know what the position was of the ministry with all the various uh, undertakings they were trying to give to various people. They were telling power jets they would protect us. They were trying to get undertakings from the Rover Company, which the undertaking Rover Company refused to give. They were trying to get undertakings from the BTH Company, which they were refusing to give. So they were in a first-class difficulty, really. And it was this, presumably, that prompted their move towards Rolls-Royce, was it? Uh, well, the uh, situation became so bad that it looked as though uh, there would be a complete hash of everything. The rover were, the rover were making such a poor job of the engine that uh, the order for the production of the meter was cut right back. And uh, then uh, Sir Wilfred Freeman uh, at the Ministry wanted to uh, hand the whole job over to Rolls-Royce. I successfully resisted that, I think I did anyway, but uh, nevertheless uh, Rolls-Royce did come into the picture in a big way in that it was agreed that they would take over the job from the Rover Company and hand over to the uh, Rover Company their tank engine, diesel engines they were making. And from the moment that Rolls-Royce took over the um, picture changed completely. How was the picture then at uh, Clitheroe at Barn Oldswick at that time, did you know? At the end of 1942, rovers were just staggering along, getting 30 hours running out of, say, six engines. And as soon as... Uh, uh, I re my feeling is that they didn't want it to work because they wanted their B-26 to supersede the W-2B. Anyway, when uh, uh, Rolls-Royce took over, within one month the running time jumped more than tenfold to over 400 hours. And one of the main agents, at any rate, one of them behind this was Sir Stanley Hooker. What was, it, what was your relationship with him, or Dr Hooker, as then called? Uh, the leading uh, people in the Rolls-Royce team, which brought about this uh, revolution, you might call it, uh, was headed by uh, Stanley Hooker, the doctor who, as he then was, and Stanley Hooker as he became later. Uh, he was a great leader. In uh, three months, uh, he and uh, the team he had at Barnaldswick had the engine up to its uh, full design performance. And in fact, uh, shortly after, they improved on it. And the main reason they did that was they made a modification to the turbine, which I'd recommended two years earlier. That was just altering the angle of the turbine blades through five degrees. And that... Uh, uh, put the engine right and it was able to give us go through its type test at full design performance. I was born on June the first, nineteen oh seven in Coventry. My parents were working class. My father was, at uh, that, that time, a foreman in Alfred Herbert's machine tool manufacturers. And uh, I lived there in Coventry for nine years, went to an elementary school there from the age of six onwards. And then the family moved to Leamington Spa because my father bought a small, very small, 
engineering outfit called the Livington Valve and Piston Ring Company. And I really did get my first engineering experiences there because I helped him sometimes for, I think it was about tuppence an hour or something like that, uh, uh, making slots in valve stems. Excellent. And um, you went to grammar school, but I think you you you, were, you had a limited application at school. Oh, uh, uh, yes. I I was very lazy w with homework, and got a, a, a series of raspberries for that. But at the end of term, I often do quite well. For instance, I'd come top of maths, something like that. I never did win a prize at school. That sounds to me as though you worked at what you liked working at and nothing else. Yes, and. Uh, one thing, of course, that uh, the school didn't realize, uh, the headmaster and teachers, they thought I was lazy and so on. So I was. I, I just uh, did not do my homework very often. But I did an awful lot of uh, private study. I used to go down to the library in Leamington Spa and study all sorts of things which were not in the school curriculum. And, uh, and that was where I first started to learn about gas turbines. Uh, the gas turbines of um, of history, what, from Parsons Day? Uh, well, no, going in, in the book, particular book that uh, I found in the library, which interested me, was by Stoddler, Steam and Gas Turbines, it was called. And uh, it went way back, you know, discussed things like Hero's Engine, which was, uh, I'm told, about 94, 95 AD, some difference of opinion as to exactly when it was. I see. Now, presumably, you made a decision when you were 15, were you, to apply for the RAF. Can you tell us what happened then? Oh, yes. I uh, uh, was always uh, attracted to flying from, from my earliest years, almost. When I was four, and my favorite toy, and this was 1911, uh, was a, a model, of, a tin model of a, a Blerio. And uh, the things I do remember rightly are aeroplanes flying. So and my heroes were people like Captain Albert Ball and Major McCudden and so on, the VCs of the First World War, and I just wanted to fly. And also, I thought that boys in the uniform of aircraft apprentices looked <laughs> very good. So I decided I'd like to wear that uniform and applied to join as an apprentice. I passed the exam all right, and uh, then I went for a, a physical at uh, Halton, and I was turned down uh, with poor physique, they called it, which burned me up because I considered myself to be an ab abnormally active child. And uh, so uh, I uh, was sunk for the time being, but before I left the camp, a, a very kindly physical training sergeant, if you can imagine such a thing, uh, <laughs> took pity on me, and he gave me a diet to follow and uh, um, a series of exercises, Max Alding exercises. I did all that for six months. I put on three inches on height and three inches on my chest. So I thought, well, I'll have another shot. And I wrote to the ministry, but they said, no, once you've uh, been turned down, you've been turned down forever. And there seemed to be no hope. And I got other people to write in for me, my physics master and other people. But no, the answer was no. I thought, well, I go through the whole process again as I'd never had, never, it had ne never happened before, in the hope that the uh, bureaucracy wouldn't pick it up. And I was lucky that time. I got through both the written exam again and the medical and ended up at Cranwell in number four wing. I didn't like a life as an apprentice. Of course, I joined because I wanted to fly. And then there seemed no hope as an apprentice. But I, uh, the one thing which brightened life was I became very interested in model aeroplanes, making them join the Model Aircraft Society and became really the leading light in that one. So so much so that uh, the initials BWMAS, which stood for Boys Wing Model Aircraft Society, was most people said that meant Boys Whitt Boy Whittle's Model Aircraft Society. <laughs> Was we are known we were known as Boy Whittle, Boy Smith, and so forth in those days. Then we became aircraft apprentices later. Then it was as as an apprentice. What did you do? A lot of mechanical engineering, as your father had done with you, or what? Uh, yes. Oh, we had courses in uh, all branches of uh, practical engineering. Uh, well, you know, workshop practice, uh, turning. The worst part, the most hateful part, was the fitting, basic fitting, filing away. 
at a uh, say a block of cast iron which is like glass and uh, sort of thing you had had a hell of a job to make any impression on with a file. Were you learning very much about aircraft structures at that time, though, or engine structures? Yes, oh yes, we had to do uh, stress diagrams and for uh, stress purposes, and we had to know how to pull engines apart and put them together and so forth. Well, there was a lot of that sort of thing. And presumably the time you'd spent with your father was useful to you. Oh yes, I, I, I was already familiar with things like lathes and drilling machines and milling machines. Was your father particularly inventive? My father was a very in inventive man, but unfortunately he um, just didn't have a, 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 the education to back it up. He, um, But every week, practically, there was some new scheme. He wasn't very persistent, you may gather, and uh, uh, one week it would be a, a gear drive, a new gear drive for a car. car. Cars were very much in their infancy in those days, or next week it would be perpetual motion. And uh, I couldn't convince him that perpetual motion wouldn't work. Life as an apprentice, uh, was it the RAF discipline that you found irksome? Oh, I didn't like the discipline at all. And uh, I particularly disliked uh, uh, stamping away on the parade ground because it did seem to me that uh, it didn't help an awful lot to, to uh, one's training in a service like the Royal Air Force. But uh, I do realise now that you... Uh, that discipline is important. How then did you become a cadet? There were to be uh, five cadets selected from number four wing at Cranwell, and uh, I was number six in the passing out list. I hadn't been a leading boy, which was uh, quite a handicap, because up to that time, no boy who hadn't been a leading boy ever made the cadet college. But... Uh, uh, Wing Commander Barton, as, as he was then, my commanding officer, had seen this large model aeroplane that we'd made, a 10-foot, six-wing skip, and that and other things, I suppose, uh, impressed him. So when the number one boy failed because of his eyesight, uh, it made me eligible. So, so I was recommended, I went through the medical, and so forth. There was another narrow escape I've since heard about, and that was that... Uh, Lord Trenchard nearly stopped it because um, I hadn't been a leading boy and I hadn't made my uh, no kind of a name in sports on which a lot of weight was put in those days. And he said to Barton, you're sure you're not making a mistake? So I'm, according, this is according to Trenchard's biography. In that biography, it says that Barton said that he thought that he'd got a, a, a mathematical genius but Trenchard said, all right, Barton, but if you may have made a mistake, I'll never forgive you. So, the RAF nearly went without the jet several times over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was excellent. So you come to be a cadet. Doing what at first, I think? Uh, as cadets, we had a very full program, uh, of which, from my point of view, and from the point of view of most of us, uh, flying was by far the most important. We only had two or three uh, flying periods a week, but uh, that was a real highlight of the whole course. We, uh, otherwise, we covered service subjects like Air Force law, uh, buzzing, that's Morse code, and, uh, um, well, everything connected, which is particular to a, a fighting service. And then humanistics, you know, we had to read certain, uh, like, Lamb's essays and... I had to write an essay on that, and uh, uh, there was humanistics, that particular branch, uh, and then hist and included history, and quite a lot of um, workshop uh, stuff, uh, rigging aeroplanes, putting engines, up, pulling engines apart and putting them together again. But the great joy was flying, was it? Was, oh, yeah. your, your, was, was your, if you can just say that again, um, was your physique no limitation on, on actual cockpit uh, drill? I wasn't, uh, my uh, comparatively small physique, I should say, it was rather useful in flying. It, um, uh, I, there's no problem about uh, physique uh, sitting in an aeroplane and flying it. And what were the, the aircraft types? They were presumably wooden fabric, were they? I learned to fly on the Avro 504K. That was a, a, a very ancient type of aeroplane, 1911 type. And it, Sort with a toothpick between the 
wheels, you know, uh, to prevent it tipping over on its nose, which in reality it helps it to tip it over on its nose <laughs> or even turn upside down. Um, which you never did. Oh, uh, no, no, I didn't in the Avro 504K, but I later did in the 504N. I'm, I have to confess I wrecked uh, uh, two or three aeroplanes. Three at least, yeah. It's in forgivable circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. Uh, um, I was in trouble, for instance, uh, the first one, shortly after I'd gone solo in a, in a 504K, I got lost. And... Uh, this was at Cranwell, and wanted to get back to Cranwell when the visibility had deteriorated very badly. I think it was down to about half a mile. And I thought the, uh, I found myself over the hangars at Digby. And I thought that the hangars at Digby ran east and west. But they didn't, they ran north and south. So I was targeting Cranwell from the line of the hangars, you see. Now, the curious thing about this, I never thought of quoting it in my defense. Where the compass should have been, there were just four screw holes. I didn't have a compass. But I never thought of quoting that about it. What did happen was that uh, I aimed 90 degrees in the wrong direction, realized that I was getting more and more lost, saw what I thought was a beautiful green field, and it was young corn with very soft soil. So when I landed, I pulled up very smartly, and the wheel sank in. And I tried to find out where I was, and only some farm yokels came up, and they couldn't really tell me. They said Cranwell was over there pointing, and uh, or Seaford was. They didn't know where Cranwell was. And uh, anyway, in the end, I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to have another shot. So I got one of them to swing the prop, trained him what to do, you know, contact, switch off, contact, switch off. Then, uh, when I got all set, uh, he forgot all the drill. He said, be you ready to start us, sir? And all words to that effect. Anyway, I got going. And then when I opened up the engine, see, my wheels had sunk in so that uh, I didn't move for a, moment, uh, a few seconds, that just the tail just lifted with, in the uh, slipstream. I thought, well, if I can get moving a little bit, it'll uh, begin to ride over the muck. And so that's what happened. I was watching the hedge getting nearer and nearer, rain all over the windscreen. I, oh, I'm going to, I'm, I've made it. So I sat back, and then to my horror, dead ahead was about the only tree for miles around, and I couldn't miss it. I just flew straight into it. Uh, were you hurt? No, no, no. The aeroplane was, it wasn't much good. But there was a court of inquiry, presumably. No, no, no. I, I just got a rocket from my flight commander. It was the day, incidentally, of the cross country run at Cranwell which all cadets hated. And they, uh, most of my fellow cadets thought I'd done it to get out of the cross-country room. <laughs> <laughs> Splendid anecdote. I think, we, I think we have to come to the fourth year thesis now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, could you just take me through that and, and say to me that didn't, everyone had to write this thesis yeah. uh, and just tell the story in your own terms? A lot of people keep asking me how the jet job started. So, and I tell them uh, the fact, which is that... Uh, as a fourth termer, I, I had to write a cadet, a, a thesis. Uh, all cadets had to write a thesis. And um, uh, I'd written uh, three on one, parts one, two, and three of chemistry in the service of the area. But for my fourth term, I chose future developments in aircraft design, rather ambitious and rather concentrated on the engine side. But the main thing in that thesis was that uh, I arrived at what I now know, know was the well-known Breguet formula. I wasn't familiar with it at the time. Connecting speed, range, engine efficiency, and so forth. And to me, that meant that if you wanted to go very fast and far, you would have to go very high, heights of 50,000 feet, that sort of thing. At heights where the piston engine obviously wouldn't work, and at speeds, it's a pro uh, where the propeller wouldn't work. So it was, I started to look for a new kind of power plant. Well, I was struggling with uh, this, uh, looking for a new kind of propulsion. I looked into the rockets, and uh, cal my calculation showed that you, with a bit of luck, you might get 10 minutes endurance, which isn't a lot of use for aeroplanes. So I 
then turned to gas turbines and driving a propeller. But of course, the snag was I still had the propeller, which um, uh, just is no good for very high speeds. The height doesn't bother it too much, but um, it just doesn't like the high speeds. Because uh, um, you have the tip speed, which is pretty fast, say 800 feet a second, added to the forward speed vectorially, so that you end up uh, with the tip going beyond the speed of sound. And under those circumstances, the shock waves and things that form greatly reduce the efficiency of the propeller. After considering other things, when I was in the 111th Squadron uh, as a pilot officer flying Siskins, I considered a piston engine driving a fan inside a hollow fuselage, the scheme which Cap Caproni Campini later did, uh, tried out. And uh, that, uh, according to me, wasn't much good because it was, it was just as heavy as a piston engine, if not heavier. And uh, the fuel consumption was shocking, so I discarded that. And then thought, well, why not throw that piston engine away the compression ratio of the fan and substitute a turbine for the piston engine. And there was the turbojet. This was really the, 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 the moment of discovery. Did it come to you out of the blue? Well, I've been, uh, I'd, it didn't come to me out of the blue for the simple reason that I've been trying to find it for 18 months. And, uh, but just the, the thought, get rid of the piston engine and substitute a turbine. You might say that came out of the blue whether I was having a bath or what, whatever at the time, I couldn't tell you, I, I forget. But you did wonder afterwards, I think, like so many inventors, that why it had taken so long. I did indeed. Uh, well, I wondered, after the idea had come to me, I thought, oh, my goodness, why didn't I think of this before? And it seemed so obvious then. So how was your Cranwell thesis received, Sir Frank? My Cranwell thesis... Um, when the professor marked it, he wrote on it, uh, in effect, because he didn't really understand it, but he gave me 30 out of 30, which I thought was quite satisfactory. Ard, uh, Ardy Williams, who became so very important uh, in the development, is now Sir Ralph Dudley Williams. Was a, He was a first-termer with me at Cranwell. We were in the same hut, in fact, and uh, I help, used to help him with his... Uh, more technical uh, studies, and uh, we kept in touch. And and when I was at Felix, there was a float plane test pilot. He was there as a member of a flying boat squadron, temporarily at Felix. Stowe, by by which time I'd had the idea, and uh, had discussed it with various people. And at Felix, Stowe, incidentally, it was considered quite a joke amongst my brother officers. It, Leonard Snaith, uh, one of the pilots there, christened it Whittle's, Whittle's Flaming Touch Hole. So I'd frequently been greeted with the, uh, how, uh, how's the old Flaming Touch Hole getting on? Uh, of course, it wasn't getting on at all, because uh, though uh, I'd been helped to take out a patent by uh, W.E.P. Johnson, another close colleague, um, it wasn't making any progress. But then Dudley Williams came into the story later on uh, he was invalided out. He wasn't well, and it, he was placed on the retired list. He joined up with another officer who had been invalided out after a bad crash. And the two of them approached me in 1935, after many, I'd made many unsuccessful attempts to get the thing exploited, and uh, asked me whether I'd done anything about it. If not, he thought he might be able to raise some money. Can I just take you back? Fine. I knew there was somebody with initials W. E. <laughs> I'm not wrong. Can I just take you back to um, to the fact that your CO became interested, referred you to the Air Ministry, and then you yeah. went to see first. I think it was um, uh, Tweedy, wasn't it, who took you to Griffin? Yes. Could we go through that? Yes. Uh, when I, uh, at the end of 1929, uh, when the idea came to me, I was at the Central Flying School at Wittering, uh, doing the flying instructors course. One of the instructors there was W.E.P. Johnson, who became a very good friend and colleague in later years, and he'd been trained as a patent agent. And he became very really interested in my proposal. He thought it would work, and he helped me to draft a patent. But before that, he'd gone to Group Captain Baldwin, as he then was, the commandant of the CFS, he convinced him that he'd, I'd got something that would work. 
and Baldwin sent me to the air ministry to see a man named Tweedy, who then took me to see A. A. Griffith and another scientist, air minister scientist, at the Kensington, Kensington Laboratory. Well, I explained it, and uh, uh, Griffith uh, pointed out an error in my calculations, and it was all rather depressing, though. And then after that, I got a letter from the air minister saying, in effect, that uh, they weren't really interested and so forth. Were you aware at that time that A. A. Griffith was working on a similar development? I'd seen uh, uh, my A. A. Griffith. I, I, I knew was interested in gas turbines because I'd, Tweedy had shown me a paper that Tweedy had written on the um, theory of design of uh, compressors, axial flow compressors. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors, and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works' Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunder Chief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt ME262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescape's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.